Um, Joey, very pleased to meet you. Um, also known as Riverman, for very good reason. Until about five years ago, you were a deputy head teacher, I think. And nowadays, wearing a wetsuit and snorkeling gear, you're usually to be found photographing and filming beneath the surface of our wonderful, if threatened, local rivers, capturing the underwater habitats and the wildlife that hopefully lies within. You spend much of your time, I think, at Gilfach. A lot of it at Gilfach, yes. <laughs> and you recently appeared on a BBC Wales TV programme. It wasn't crime watch. <laughs> <laughs> I could see someone looking. It wasn't. Oh, it well, wasn't great. I wasn't much. going to tell them, but you. <laughs> that was that was a mistaken identity. <laughs> I'm sure you'll tell people what it actually was. Um, and tonight he's going to share some of his wonderful experiences and some of the beautiful photographs that he's produced. So over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Can you all hear me? Yeah. I'm a bit out of practice. I must admit. This is the first talk I've given in over 18 months, and this is the first talk I've given on this topic. I have given lots of talks before, but this is the first one on this specific topic. Okay. <laughs> is that better without? Can you hear me without this thing? Okay, that might be better. You need to turn the that was my fault. Pardon? Need the mic for Zoom. Oh, okay, need the mic for Zoom. Okay, that's fair enough. Okay, um, yeah, as, as we were said, um, I'm not as a river man. It isn't just underwater, uh, my go, I film. I also, I shouldn't be there yet. There we are. Um, I also film above the water and all sorts of things. And it isn't just water either, really. I do film all sorts of things. But I love rivers. To be honest, they're my life. It's as simple as that. I can't really explain it any other way. They are my life. After I left teaching, for various reasons, even though I've loved rivers since I was a child, that's grown more and more uh, into a beautiful relationship. Well, I think it's beautiful anyway. And that's what counts really. This first photograph, you might recognize it. That's a Gilbach. It doesn't look like that now because it's very low, as you know. But this was taken last autumn, and I'm starting my talk at Gilbach in the autumn for obvious reasons, because we have these iconic creatures that are on their way up from the North Atlantic. I bet you, I was going to say, you probably can't guess what's in my, but I, I think I've given the game away now. You ready for this? No? <laughs> Say hello to my friend. <laughs> this is an Atlantic salmon. It's not really an Atlantic salmon. Is what I'm thinking. Well, it is. It's supposed to be representative of an Atlantic salmon. This is Salmo sala, the scientific name. Um, this is a good size for a salmon. This is a female hen salmon, and they do get this big up here on the Y from the mountain. Um, but to give you an idea of the size, this is about. Um, 75 centimeters, three feet long. They got, they will grow over a meter. To give you an idea of, of um, this photograph is of a hen salmon jumping at Gilbach last year. To give you an idea of the height they can jump, and they've been recorded in Scotland jumping. You ready for this? Now I'm six foot tall. They've been recorded jumping 12 feet. And then a 12 foot jump is just about, I'm guessing about where that beam is there. That's only if the water's deep enough at the bottom. Now that Gilvach, it's a cascading waterfall, as you know. So they go up in a series of steps to try and overcome this magical of obstacle. That's uh, a male uh, salmon taken in the same place last year. I know it's a male because it's got a special type of jaw which has changed during its time in fresh water called a kipe. And they're bigger. The males are bigger. Now then, I'm going to stay a lot at Gilbach because when I first suggested doing a talk on freshwater worlds, I thought, have I bitten off more than I can chew? Because I have literally hundreds of thousands of things I could show you. 
and unfortunately I have got to leave a lot out so I'm going to apologize to all the creatures that I have to miss out and to any fan of those particular creatures as well. Okay so this is the waterfall as it will be soon in the autumn at Gilbach. So what happens they will come um, and make their way point can't it point when I'm pointing it onto the screen funny enough. Oh well, doesn't matter. So what will happen is a salmon such as this will smell their way back all the way from the North Atlantic, which in, its, in itself is a remarkable thing, smelling their way back with something called an olfactory nerve. And then they will jump in stages all the way to the top. Well, I say they will, um, some will, some won't. But what's um, remarkable here is that they will do it in stages and you may well be lucky enough to see them on the side resting because they won't go all the way up in one go necessarily because it's such a big um, amount of water for them to go through. So what they do, they'll take rests. So here's one resting at Gilbach, just on the side being buffeted by the water and you will see them as well being pushed back, um, but then they'll try again, and they'll try again. Um, and eventually they will succeed if they decide to go up there. Now then at Gilbach, I'm sure you know there's a wash pool. Um, can I have a hands up if you've been to Gilbach? I'm sure you've all been to Gilbach. Can I have a hands up? So I know you've all been pretty much, one or two haven't. Um, it's my favorite nature reserve. And there's lots of reasons for that. The main one being it has a river in it and it's got some ponds and it's got a waterfall. It's got lots of history and so on. But the main reason is the river and you can get quite close to the river. So this is this photograph here shows a part of the river downstream of the washpool in November last year. So as you can see, some of the stones are lighter colored. Those are something called reds. So what happens is that salmon, the female, will come along and she will use a body to excavate a red using her tail. She doesn't touch the stones as such, although she might do, but she will do this to dislodge them. That's why all those stones on the far side are lighter colored. <laughs> why this doesn't work on this, I have no idea. Anyway. Now, the, on my photo as well, there's at least four salmon there, side by side. I don't know, can you see them? Yeah. Yeah. Oops, oh, oh gosh, way off. Um, again, there's something to look out for when you're walking along the river Martek, because a lot of people go head off straight towards the salmon, the viewing point, which is fine. But it's always worth just walking slowly, quietly, and having a look on the side there there's a good chance you'll see salmon there. You do have to look carefully and you have to have her eye in, um, but there's at least five there. Now then the one on the top right, which is magically come on, um, this shows the female on the side actually doing the process, which I just described, excavating the red. And that is to create um, a depression in the riverbed and into that depression, she will, lay a she will lay her eggs, thousands of them, but only when she's ready. And only when the male is alongside. It's a very quick process when they're together. And that shows them in the bottom right there. They are, very, they are ready pretty much to fertilize in that photo there, if memory serves me right. And then she will then move upstream then. She will excavate another egg upstream. And then as she's doing that, that process will fill the first one. And then she'll go upstream again and again. So she could have a series of seven or eight of them in the same path. Again, it's worth looking out for them on rivers. Now then this is interesting because this is below the waterfall. So that means that these salmon don't bother going up the waterfall which would suggest strongly that they were born there in this very spot. So they don't bother going all that massive upheaval 
energy sapping all the way up the waterfall. Interesting, isn't it? Must be reasons for that. Now then, a shout out to the trout as well. Trout also jump. And when you go and look at the salmon, there's a very good chance you'll see trout jumping at the same time. Our trout are traditionally smaller here anyway. They do get very big, they get bigger than this one sometimes in some rivers, but here locally, they are pretty small. Um, you can see that, look at the size of that fish to, to the size of the waterfall. In terms of body length, it's quite an achievement even compared to the salmon, isn't it? In terms of timing, I've seen a trout jump May this year. And I've also seen one two or three weeks ago when the river is very low. In fact, I didn't expect to see one with the river so low, but they're there. And it's probably, it's probably trout that are moving upstream to get territory, to plant their territory, because they're very territorial trout, as are salmon. <clears throat> are you with me? Am I going too fast? <laughs> Trick. Don't mind. It is, it is orange and lemonade, I promise. <laughs> Someone said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip this, the autumn. So my idea was to go all through it, way through the year. It hasn't quite worked like that because of time. Um, but this is just a general photograph taken in winter, just showing part of the majesty of, of Gilbach. Um, because you've got so much in that one photo, really, uh, to exemplify why Gilvach is so beautiful. Uh, you've got the magic spider's webs draped over the, the branches. You've got the moss. You've got the lichen. There are over 400 kinds of lichen at Gilvach. 400! What amazes me about that fact is the fact that somebody knows that and can identify the different ones. <laughs> I mean, there must be somebody here, I think is amazing. Somebody knows a species. Come on, who is that? Here we are, isn't that amazing? And I think it's such a beautiful thing, human nature. There's a lot of negativity about things in nature, but there's so much hope I have as well with people like, who can identify things like that at species level. Um, and another thing as well is plants, of course. Um, I am gonna concentrate on the, uh, on the fauna tonight simply because of time. Um, but there's so many plants that I could have mentioned, uh, willows, alders, uh, rowans, um, and so forth. But I'm going to focus just on the, uh, on the creatures. Just a bit of a heads up with the moss there. It's something magical about moss, isn't there? Um, what do you think has built that? Dipper. Dipper. Very good. And again, this is a Gilbach again. Uh, between the lower fall and the upper fall, overhang, big overhang. I did notice the, the, um, the, the nest, first of all, I must admit, but I did see the dipper landing right by it, looking around, and that was a very good clue because they never fly straight into the nest. They always land and suss things out first just to make sure there's nothing looking after them, look, looking after them. And if you're, very, if you're careful, you can see something peeping its head out of the nest as well there because... Um, these at Gilvach, uh, I think this was in mid-March, um, there were at least two or three chicks inside that nest. And both parents were very, very busy. Very busy, to say the least. Uh, talk about good parenting skills. Absolutely amazing. When you think the amount of work they have to do, constantly back and forth, back and forth, it's a good time to see dippers. In fact, Martek is fantastic to see dippers all through the year. And what do they eat? What do they eat? What do they feed the chicks on? Caddis fly larva, somebody said. What else? Have a think about that. So there's one on the top left there by, by a boulder, classic uh, sort of habitat for the, for the dipper. And they will basically fly underwater. Um, the only songbird that do that. Beautiful birds. Um, can't really give you a talk on freshwater without mentioning and showing this uh, beauty. I do can see kingfishers a lot. I'm lucky because I spend so much time in and around rivers. And I always 
um, I love them every time I see one, like I do with any bird, really, or any creature, that there is something truly magical about a kingfisher, isn't there? Just look at that beak. And they dive blind. Um, in other words, once they hit the water, they, they don't open their eyes. So they have to adjust the angle of refraction and all sorts of things before they hit that water. And they don't spear the fish either. They'll grab it with their beaks like that. And this one was, was kind enough to land right by me. I think it's a young male, this one. And I was there filming the kingfishers with a telephoto, not kingfishers, a San Martins with a telephoto lens on the River Seven, this was. And lo and behold, this kingfisher landed pretty much right by me where that uh, salmon is there and was there for ages, 20 minutes. <laughs> and I snapped away quite happily. But just look at the colours there. You tend to think of kingfishers maybe being blue. They are blue. It isn't just blue, is it? Look at that orange. Um, Grey wagtail top left, another classic bird. Uh, they tend to feed more on the insects on the side, maybe on the edges. They will go into the water as well, but not half as much as a dipper will. Uh, bottom right doesn't need any introduction, does it? Another classic bird. This was taken a predator on the Y from the bridge. Very good place to see wildlife, by the way. I'm sure you know bridges. Always worth stopping on bridges. I get funny looks now and again. Different people. What are you doing there? Well, what do you, you know, it's all sorts of things. It's, it's, it's a good place to see wildlife. But look at the beak. Very similar design to the kingfisher. Does the same job in a way, but at a bigger scale. Now then, here we are. I could talk all night about these creatures. I could talk all night about everything I'm talking about, to be honest. So many different things to look at. But these are absolutely awesome. There, there's no other way of saying it. Um, and I'm sure they, you know what these are. Yes? They're kind of fly larvae. When we talked about the dippers, um, somebody answered, didn't they? A kind of fly larvae is one of the main things they eat. And a lot of them build cases. Now then they will build cases out of all sorts of things. Little sand grains, bits of gravel, bits of plant, bits of bark. Some will have two, they'll combine them. Um, like, the, like the third one along from the top there. Um, but you think of the intricacy of that. They're the same size as my fingernail. And they will build things that they find, of course. So they are basically original recyclers, aren't they? And they use silk to glue them together. A beautiful. And the, a dipper doesn't eat it whole, as I'm sure you gathered. A dipper, if you see, if you look at dippers long enough, you'll notice now and again the dipper will bang a beak against the branch. And that's to dislodge the, uh, the caddis from inside. So when you see a full beak of invertebrates, a lot of that has been dislodged. Okay, so what else? Um, there are caseless caddis. Some decide not to build cases. Evolution has got a different way for these lot. Um, some are completely free living, like the top right. The bottom pair, um, those are, does anybody recognize those? They are net spinning caddis, they're hydropsyche or water spirit. What a name, water spirit. And they build nets using silk to capture drifting food. They get their food delivered, <laughs> don't they? Very reliable because there's always a drift. And this is why they build their nets in the fastest part of the current. They, this was on the river Hydo, but these are also on the Y, thousands of them. And these are having, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about those at bottom if there's time at the end, which there probably won't be. Anybody know what these are? These are mayflies. Um, may, it's a bit confusing with mayflies because mayfly is a name for a, an individual a creature and a family and a big group. There are 51 species of mayfly in Britain alone. And these are just some of them. These are very common. Um, top left and middle one, that's something called the flattened mayfly to give it its common name, or heptagenidae. These crawl underneath the stones, they'll cling on. If you lift pretty much any stone in a the river, there's a very good chance you'll have one of these in there. Top right, those are betidae, the olives. There are literally thousands and thousands, millions of them 
in one patch. Very important food source. Without these guys and creatures like them, there'd be no dippers, there'd be no grey whacktails, and, and so on up the food chain. Uh, mayflies famously, when you, when you hear people talk, they present mayflies live for a day. It's not strictly true because they spend most of their lives underwater, of course. I don't want them to sound pedantic, but that's the truth. Same with lots of creatures. Lots of creatures I'm talking about start off their life underwater for lots of reasons, mainly safety. There's lots of food for them as well. Once they get above the water, very dangerous place, as you can imagine, that, that underwater is very dangerous, but up, above is even more dangerous to a certain extent. Um, some of them don't even have mouth pads because all they are interested in, or all they will do is to breed, is to mate, find a mate and pass on the genes to the next generation. This is a mayfly underwater laying eggs. Again, that's for protection. So they will land on a stone, crawl underneath it and lay eggs onto the stone surface using glue. So you'll stick them on. She's got this silvery sheen to it because that's air trapped around the body. <coughs> because as she goes under, she goes under with some air, as any creature would really, as we would, to an example. Stonefly. Stoneflies, again, there's different, different species of stonefly. This particular one is carnivorous. It's, it's tucking into a, another larvae, can't make out what it is. Um, it's an indicator species, as all these are. If there's a stonefly in your river, it's pretty much as a healthy river, uh, or, or at least a healthy section of a river. <coughs> so when we, we hear a lot of talk about the why and so on, this is where science should come in. This is the type of thing that people will presumably are doing is to monitor and to look at the biodiversity and to look if there's species like this because they're very sensitive to pollution. And that's an adult there. They have their wings folded horizontally, one on top of the other. Um, a lot of the time when you're looking at wildlife, they, there are things hitching on onto other things all the time. Um, it could be a mayfly on top of a caddis and so on. This particular one is, is a mayfly on top of the snail. And the snail is alive, it's just moving along. And the, the mayfly is just feeding on the algae. Because everything underwater has got life living on it, pretty much, even a stone. So this is a, is a scene just underwater just showing you what a healthy, really vibrant section looks like. A, from a photography point of view, it's absolutely amazing. Um, a lot of these um, things here, structures here are caddis. You can see here, and there's some uh, olive mayflies there as well. Um, and that is also where a lot of the fish would be. And because there's fish there, that's where the bird life would be. So when we talk about a healthy river, the more it looks like that with leaf debris and so on, the better it is by a long way. Doesn't need an introduction, really, does it? Or well, maybe it does. Anybody recognize the species? No? Too shy. I bet you there are. You're just too shy. Um, a male southern hawker. Uh, it's got a distinctive bent abdomen. One of the only uh, dragonflies that's relatively straightforward to photograph because the male will always come up to you as if to say, yeah, what are you doing here? <laughs> the others uh, fly further away. Uh, absolutely amazing creatures. Um, this year, I had a few targets this year. I always have targets to try and do things. One of them was to see an emergence of a dragonfly and a damselfly. And I was lucky to see both, again, at Gilbach. Early in the day, I have seen lots of stages of them, but I never saw the complete sequence until this year. A nice warm day, not very warm, but it was warm enough. And on the left hand side, I saw this chap. Um, and I thought, wow, this is it. And I waited around a few minutes and then this happened. So it splits its case after climbing out of the reed, probably during the night, very, very early in the morning. That just took a few minutes, and then it took long, long time then 
because it's all about the wings after that. But just look at the wing case there. Just look at the size of the wings in the second photograph. And now it's trying to, it move, maneuvers a bit on the, on the stem. And you can see the case just above it there. Um, and then it will take hours then for this next photo, for the wings to get to lengthen, to harden, to dry and to change color. And then the very final stage, well, in fact, before I come to the final stage, again, this is a Gilbach. One, two, three, four. Can you see them on the stems there? And I think my record was nine. So nine different ones. Very similar stage in their emergence. Uh, absolutely, you can see the whole sequence in a way, because afterwards you will see them with their wings open. Once a dragonfly opens its wings like this, they'll never close them again. And one has flown already, the second one. They're the, both, both the same area. Taken its first flight, maiden flight, straight into the trees. And then they will then wait a day or two until they're really ready, change their color. And then they'll fly back, they'll find a mate and so on. Carry on the next generation. Look at that. Absolutely stunning, isn't it? It's all to look at those eyes, look at those compound eyes. 360 degree vision, you can see all the way around, and the wings, and look at the flight muscles on that, built for flight. They're absolutely magnificent flyers. Flew long before the birds, love birds, I really do love birds, but these guys have been around for 300 million years, long before the dinosaurs. And here's one laying eggs on pondweed at Gilbach. Um, different ways that they will deposit eggs. This particular one that lands on the pond and lays like this. Does anybody know what this character is? This is a damselfly uh, nymph, very similar to a dragonfly, same order really, same group, but they're smaller, more dainty. Uh, and this is a nymph. Um, you can see just below the eye, there's something called a mask there. This is a special hinged jaw that shoots out to capture prey. It's a remarkable piece of engineering. And the tail filaments there, they look like feathers. Those are the gills. And they normally have three. This one sort of appears to have lost one. Again, very common. Probably a predator, like a newt, has taken it. It comes off quite easily, apparently. And again, this, this is a photo, another photo of a damselfly, but I'm showing you this. It's not a good photo, but it shows you, um, I'm sure you can see something else in that picture as well. There's a little water flea there on the right-hand side by the feathers. It's something called a cyclops. It's, it's a little crustacean, a little tiny crustacean. And it's an example of a photo that I quite often I'll take photos underwater and I'll obviously see the damselfly because that's relatively big. But when I go home on the computer, there's a few other things I've seen I've on the computer screen, which I didn't notice at the time. And that's an example of one. And again, without these, there'd be no damselflies because they are uh, source of fruit, food for the damselfly. And then I am running over time. I'm aware of that already, I can see here. And um, so I'm gonna race, not race, but I am gonna shoot not shoot through, what's the term? Um, go a little bit at a faster pace, more like a dragon, more like um, a salmon going up the waterfall. Are you with me with on that? Yeah? There we are. Here we are. These, again, are Gilbach. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say it's a Gilbach unless, unless I say otherwise. Um, these are large red damselflies uh, laying eggs. The male is at the top, female at the bottom. Um, Different damselflies do this in different ways. These do it this way. The reason the male is like that is, is to stop other males getting on top. It's basically um, a strategy to protect their DNA, essentially. Um, and this particular one, um, this is a female um, beautiful demoiselle. Uh, th that is a classic uh, river damselfly. Metallic blue, the males, as I'm sure you've seen them, absolutely stunning. And um, this one has gone underwater 
and his laying eggs in the plants. You can see on the bottom right, you can actually see how she's inject, how she's cutting into the stem. Can you see that? It's a little hook. And that's how she's cutting into the stem and then she'll lay an egg and she'll carry on doing that. As, you've see, as you can see a little bit, a few holes just to the right there. The reason she's gone right under the water is that because there's other males around of the same species trying to get in on the action. Did everybody say typical then? Did I hear everybody say typical? No, no. Um, again, it, it, it's to make sure that she can, she can lay her eggs in peace without being disturbed. Very risky. Uh, fish could get her, amphibians, but this is how they've designed um, to pass on. And this is a damsel fly nymph. Again, I, won't show, I haven't got the whole sequence. I did film the whole, whole sequence. Um, this was a large red damsel fly, if you can believe that. So this will change into one of those beautiful red damselflies. There we are, coming to say hello. A damselfly is a very, I've got different uh, structure to the eye. They're designed so they can look just like this around the stems like that. And if you stand in front of a stem with a damselfly in it, they will follow you around like this. They will literally follow around the stem looking at you. It's amazing. And quite often as well, damselflies and dragons will land on you. I've had mating pairs on me, I feel, oh gosh, you know, a little bit like that. And the best I had this year was one started to lay eggs on my leg. I thought, no, it gives you an indication of the state of my leg more than anything, I think. There's quite a bit of mud on it. But I did gently encourage her to leave her leg laying to a more, um, you know, a, a, a better place. Um, very different tack now, totally different, if you like. Uh, it isn't just creatures I, I film and photograph, I film all sorts. Um, and this is one of the things I film, which is the magical natural sculptures you see underwater. Some of which may surprise you, it certainly still surprises me. This is on the Y, north of Raida. Uh, I have permission to go in. <laughs> um, I go in in a wetsuit, I don't always go in with a wetsuit, but I do go in with a wetsuit and the snorkel because I can see things easier then and so on. And um, just look at that. The sculptures underwater are as beautiful as anything you see above the water, even more so really, because it's completely hidden from, from the outside world essentially. Um, and you've got, this is created by the rushing water coming down, of course, the stones being wished and swirled around by, by the river, especially in the winter. You've got, you've got like pedestals and that's inside a pothole. I am writing a a book, by the way, just throwing this bit of a, a thing into here. I'm writing a book with two, uh, two friends from Aberystwyth University on river potholes. Just something for you to look out for, you know, at all good booksellers certainly at some point, <laughs> looking at the ecology and so on. Just thought I'd mention that. Okay, I was, um, I was uh, snorkeling um, earlier this year, and you never know what you're going to see. That's the beauty of going in a river. You, you just don't know what you're going to see. Um, which is true of anything, really, isn't it, uh, effectively, but it's especially true in rivers. Anyway, I was uh, snorkeling away quite happily, and then I saw this thing in front of me, and it was a big eel, about three feet long. Now, the eels are critically endangered. I have seen eels before, the little ones, the elvers, but this is the first adult eel I've seen underwater. And I expected it just to swim off, like fish quite often do swim off, some don't, some do come to one. This did, it turned around and it swam right towards me. I was in like same height as this of depth of water really, but I'd say 12 feet of, of water. So I couldn't stand in other words. And then it just swam right up underneath me, uh, looked up and thought, yeah, and then did like a figure of eight and then swam off. <laughs> Even though I love rivers and I always feel at home in rivers, when you really see creatures like that, you realize, wow. <laughs> It's talk about adaptations and being sort of honed in with the evolution to the environment is absolutely amazing. And when I see things like that, I can't really describe it to a group like you, to be honest, because it just fills me. It isn't just joy. It's far more than that. I don't think there is a word for it, really. Um, I just feel privileged, I suppose, as well, to be able to see it. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about fish. I could talk again all night about fish. Um, 
Does anybody recognize this little character? Is it, it's, it's quite hard to see, to be fair. This was um, not at Gilbach, funny enough, but they probably are at Gilbach. Um, this is a three three spine stickleback, about the size that's about the size of your thumb, I suppose. And this is in a place called Llinavan near Llanidlas, where I live. And um, I'd seen these quite a few times earlier in the day, and then I noticed that one or two of them were making holes with their snouts and very fine sediment in the bottom. And I thought, wow, I'd seen something similar on Spring Watch, so I just hung around. Um, this is right on the edge now of the lake with, with the water going out. So there's oxygen going past and so on. So I hung around just to see what happened next. So what this is a male on the right. And what he's doing, he's getting the nest ready. And caddis flies being caddis flies, they keep on doing that back and forth like this, you know. So when they were getting close to the nest, which is the hole, they were being picked up by this little stickleback. It was quite funny, actually. So you could imagine him saying, flip the neck, I've told you before, you know, don't go anywhere near that. And, there, and then I realized they were females then watching all of this, just on the edge. And he must have done a good job because, lo and behold, there's the female there in the photo on, on the left-hand side of the bottom, getting into the nest, because basically that's what it is, a nest, a little hole. And then he made no... Uh, he, he went very quickly then, so presumably she, she laid the eggs. I didn't actually see that because it was all hidden. Um, and then he went in straight afterwards and basically pushed her through. And presumably then he um, laid his milt on top and so, and so forth. And then what was interesting with this particular uh, fish, it happened at the, near Father's Day. They are meticulous in their care, the, the, the father, the male. The female will go off because uh, she's basically done a job. But it's the male then that looks after the nest. He will constantly move his body to make sure there's oxygen going into the nest. Constantly and moving these caddis away, making sure that everything's nice and tidy and so on. It was magical. And I'd never seen that before, apart from telly. Again, very common. Um, these are any pond. And even in like a bucket of water, probably would have these. If you've got ponds at home, probably you have probably you've got these. These are back swimmers or water boatmen, uh, together with the other, uh, other titles. They will also go underwater uh, if they're disturbed. Again, they're bugs, predators. Um, you look at those legs, the big long legs, they're fringed with hairs to increase the surface level, uh, surface area, I should say, in order to, to push back. And then you've got some that um, swim back uppermost. Um, these are, again, water boatmen, but they're just different, different ways of swimming. Uh, again, very quick, I'm going to race through some of these. Um, I'm aware of time, and I'm aware you've been sitting through an AGM as well, and you've been very patient. And as far as I can tell, there's nobody sleeping as yet. Well, there's nobody sort of snoring, anyway, which is always a good sign. Skaters. Um, there's different kinds of skaters. There's about 10 species of skaters in Britain. The pond skaters are the classic ones, of course, but the ones in rivers are, are much bigger. They're almost twice the size. And they will quite often swim right into the middle as well. And seeing them in the rain is amazing. The raindrop will sl slap on them, they just get on with it. Um, water crickets, they have designed, they can um, produce an enzyme that hits the water surface and releases the surface tension, so they zoom across. A water measurer, this one stabbed a springtail. Um, again, um, they tend to be a little bit more dainty, um, not as confident as the, uh, as the skaters. I'm not being uh, rude to them, it's just the way they design. And these are very common, this is a whirly gig beetle, as I'm sure you've, you've seen, they tend to congregate in groups, whirling around like this. And the most magical thing about these characters, they've got two pairs of eyes, one to look above the surface and one below. I wish I'd had those designed, you know? <laughs> so you can just go along and see above and below. I have tried with a camera, it never quite works, but they do it all the time. So they can see what's above and what's below. Um, the, one of the most diverse groups are the beetles, as you can imagine. 
Um, there are 350 species of water beetles in Britain alone. And when you're looking at any kind of water body, you will see beetles, they have to come up for air all the time. And this one on the right is underwater and um, he or she, I'm not sure which, has got a sort of uh, air trapped in the back there. Uh, basically like an oxygen tank effectively. And that then oxygen diffuses into that um, water bubble. Um, great diving beetle larva. Lots of beetles are tiny, just a few millimeters, but some are big. Great diving beetle. Well, when I say big, it's all relative, isn't it? Relatively big. Um, these are very, very fierce predators. This one on the bottom right is called a ne uh, newt eft, a young newt, and they will basically suck it dry. Um, something maybe you're not familiar with. This is on the Y, bottom right, also a better picture. These are non-biting mage lava structures. They build these cases out of sand and silk and they filter food. And on the top left, all those little structures are cases of them. There are millions of them. So when you put your hand, I'm always careful now when I put my hand because you, there's a chance you'll, you'll, you'll damage <laughs> these structures. <coughs> And um, that's an older fly um, laying eggs and it'll race through these um, uh, water. Sorry, I've, I've been trying to do too much. Uh, freshwater shrimp, uh, it's very common. Again, they're an important food source for birds in particular. Uh, when we're talking about um, um, a good river and so on, um, and when you're looking at photographs, it's this kind of um, image uh, that should come to mind, ideally. This is a gilbach right at the top of the waterfall. So you've got cover, very lot, very good cover either side. Um, lots, lots of trees, lots of plants, different height for different creatures. And while I'm looking at this as well, I've talked so far about all the creatures that have been specifically, um, have evolved specifically for freshwater. There are many creatures in rivers that have fallen in. And a lot of fish rely on those all the time. And that's why having trees with branches like this over the river is always good for that, as well as many other reasons. This is on the um, River Athon near Llanbrind on the Kemshis. Just look at that on the left-hand side in particular. And just look at the, um, the, the, the roots on the left-hand side and the woody debris. Again, fantastic. Some people say, oh, it's all that rubbish in the river, you know, they, 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 the tree trunks, they, they want to clean. No, it's the opposite. So the, the more trees and branches and things are in the river, the better it is. Uh, toads, I do love toads. I love them. I love amphibians generally, to be honest. Yeah, so cool. Again, this is at Gilbach. Um, these are film stars. These appeared in the TV program on the bottom there. Uh, on the top left, you'll see them all together there. It's not exactly romantic uh, how they do it, and neither is it with frogs, as I'm sure you know. It does get quite vicious there. But on the, on the other hand, it is quite beautiful as well. On the bottom there, you can see their um, stringed um, eggs and so on, which are, quite, which, are, which are tougher than they look. And on the top right there, that's a kind of image that's taken underwater at Gilbach. The, the pond of Gilbach. Look how clear it is. It might surprise you that it's that clear at certain times of the year. And there's a toad there in the middle. Um, to give you an example of camouflage, can you see that? Um, I know it's not a perfect example, but just to give you a quick idea, there's, there's a toad on, on the bottom, the bottom square, bottom right there, and trying to blend in. And toads, of course, are very still. A lot of the time, they sort of effectively play dead. And um, newt, newt nymphet, <laughs> nymphet, and uh, newt f's on the top right. Uh, bottom left, uh, that's a male newt on the top, and they will try and press the female by moving their tails very quickly. And if the female's interested, she'll say, "Yeah, okay." But quite often, the females say, oh, God, is, that, "Is that the best you can do?" Quite often, you see the female just swimming off and say, "No, no chance." I'm, I'm just, you know, making, I'm not sure if it's a big that. You know? um, 
Now then, I haven't seen an otter yet at Marteg, at the Gilbach. I have seen otters many times, I'm lucky I've seen them many, many times, um, including this particular beautiful, um, magical encounter earlier last year um, on the River Severn and the Cluedog at Llanidlois. These are three kits or three cubs. It's much, you've got a much better chance of seeing otters when they have cubs because they constantly call to each other all the time. And these are about a year old. Um, the mother will look after them for about 14 months. And then as a, as a question of tough love, she will then take them off somewhere and basically leave them there to fend for themselves. The male has gone uh, and does his own thing. Um, and that's the way it is. But just look at the fur. They've got two different kinds of fur um, to protect them to the very, very cold um, Welsh waters and so on. And the water doesn't actually touch their skin at all. It's, they're so well waterproofed, they don't actually get wet as such as we know it. Um, I'm coming to the end, folks. I'm not too bad over, only four minutes. Um, um, yeah, I'm doing a bit of a sort of symbolic uh, slide, really. We've talked about the seven, the, the why has been in the news a lot. I know there's a lot of good work happening on the why. Um, it, can, it can be quite depressing, can't it, uh, to be honest with you. Um, and this, this is a, a, a par, which is a young salmon in the Y, um, filmed last year. And it, it wouldn't it be nice to think that when this par, having spent time on the Y, has gone back out to sea, or has gone to the sea, and when this par, when this par grows up, having fed in the North Atlantic around Greenland, by, this, by the time this, this salmon comes back, which could be four or five years in the future, if it survives, and it is a very big if, but some do, of course, as we've seen, wouldn't it be lovely to think that the why is, is, is as good as it can get? And it's our responsibility, every single one of us, that that can happen. Because for these characters, it isn't just a river, it's somewhere they live. And it's literally a life and death situation. So when we're talking about politics and all the rest of it, for these characters, it is literally their life. I know you know that, and I, I know I'm preaching to the converted, but it does need to be said over and over again. So I'm gonna finish on this little thing. That's me there on the bottom right. I was on telly and it wasn't crying much. It was something called Wales Land of the Wild. It is on BBC iPlayer. Um, you can just Google that if you want to. It gives you a little bit more of my background. It was filmed at Gilvach. Um, I can I can talk to you quite a bit about that. It was it was <laughs> it was a, a quite a strange experience, really. Um, and also the toads are also featured in the top one, although they didn't say that. That was filmed at Llandrindod, the lake at Llandrindod, but they used my footage underneath the water. They use artistic license to join the two together. <laughs> um, and there we are, folks. Um, it's only six minutes, that's not bad. Um, thanks for watching. <laughs> um, sorry I've gone on a little bit. I'm probably aware that uh, I have a habit. Once I start talking about rivers, I could literally talk all night about them. Um, any questions or comments? I, I don't know if there is, is there time for questions or comments? Yeah, that we have, we have, uh, a few, a, a few minutes of, of questions. Don't, I'm not a trained ecologist, <laughs> just a bit of a disclaimer there. Um, so I'm not an expert, but uh, I just love rivers, uh, as you might have gathered. I'm not sure if you did, but I just, I'll say that again. Um, Daryl. I was just wondering whether you managed to film toads spawning in the river itself. Uh, good question, actually. I meant to say something along those lines, actually. A lot of the creatures I've shown you today, sort of, you, you might think there's some are more pond, Summer rivers. I have seen most in both, including toads. I have filmed toads spawn in rivers, but I haven't. I haven't filmed them spawning. The big danger for frogs and toads when they grow into rivers, of course, is very different to a pond because the danger is, and I've seen this with frogs with tadpoles and their um, frog spawn, is that if the if it rains overnight, it can take the whole lot away. But it only takes two two percent.
Hi, lots of activity there. <coughs> Any other questions? We're about sticklebacks, so and I think the most common in the, in the ditches around there is the only place I've actually seen sticklebacks. Okay. Are they, you, are they more widespread? Than um, I yeah, oh, well, I'm say, I say yes. I have seen uh, a few of them about when, I, when I'm out and about in the rivers and so on. Uh, specifically, where I've seen them out here, I, I couldn't say at the top of my head. I have a huge collection of uh, of of, uh, of resources which I've collected over the years, but uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty. I'd be surprised if they're not. Again, it's like they're probably hard to see because they're small, and you do have to go underwater. And by the way, when I talk about me going underwater, which I do, there's a surprising amount of wildlife you can see without going under as well. So in other words, you can see through the water. So, you, for the example, the sticklebacks I saw, I didn't go underwater. That would be stupid for me anyway, because you'd stir up the sediment and then swim off. Um, so it's always worth looking with, with nature, because there is a chance you'll see something that other people haven't seen or noticed it's there. So it's always worth talking to people. I hope that's answered the question. Well, I've answered it maybe in a Any other questions? Yes. Uh, why is it called red? It's R E double D. Um, why red? I'm not sure uh, where the root of that is. I suppose I can Google it like anybody else, but I, I don't know where the terminology came from. No, it is a funny, funny name. Isn't it? It's basically a nest, effectively. And they almost literally don't put their oil eggs in one basket. But why are we double thing? I don't know. I will try and find out. And that's the way it is, isn't it? We always learn. There's <laughs> always something to learn in a very good, beautiful way. Shall we leave it like that? There's nobody sleeping. It's pretty good. Thank you for being so attentive. It is my first, it was my first um, talk for a while. It wasn't too bad, was it? Okay, that's good. Okay, I'm going to get to the dance. Okay, that's good. Shall we leave, I'll leave, I'll leave it there, Victoria?